I'm going to begin with a, a, a few newish poems and then read a prose piece and then maybe another poem. This is a poem called Longer. <clears throat> Experts are bragging now of our longevity. Stand up and take a bow, experts, for we are pleased as usual. You have, by miracles of science, prolonged our life to see catastrophes of science we'd otherwise have missed. <laughs> How sad to be unkissed by one's posterity ten generations hence. Each war we'll live to see will be the best so far. We'll live life without end and bury every friend less lucky than ourselves. And meanwhile, for our good, we'll take expensive pills and eat unseasoned food, uncomforted by fat, with no dessert, <laughs> no cream. We'll live past memory, our own or anybody's. <laughs> Go down in history without our teeth or hair, <laughs> commemorating time by notches in our chair. At last, life will extend into the nursing home. We'll breathe a long time there, the television on, too weak to turn it off, but still alive. <laughs> please pass the biscuits, ham and eggs, and pass the gravy, please. Cream in my coffee? Yes. And now that we have ate, you got a cigarette? <laughs> I'm going to read a little essay first uh, called Entering the 50th Millennium. It's a recent essay, uh, and it touches on two territories uh, that I think are uh, of interest to all of us. One of them is the millennium. You all know about that. Uh, and uh, another aspect of this essay is, uh, which is a very much in the presence of people here uh, on the Colorado Plateau, is prehistory, archaeology, uh, deep history. Uh, stories from the past uh, that we're all still trying to understand. This is about more of those stories. It's called Entering the 50th Millennium. Let us say that we are about to enter not the 21st century, the third millennium, but the 50th millennium. Since the various cultural calendars, Hindu, Jewish, Islamic, Christian, Japanese, etc., are each told within terms of their own stories, we can ask, what calendar would be suggested to us by the implicit narrative of contemporary Euro-American science? Since that is what provides so much of our contemporary worldview. So we might come up with a Homo sapiens calendar that would start at about 40,000 years ago, before the present, BP, uh, in what is called the Gravetian Ornesian era, at a time when the human toolkit, which had already long been sophisticated, began to be decorated with graphs and emblems. That's the time when figurines were produced, not for practical use, but apparently for magic and beauty. That's a kind of a watershed there. Place is by one definition an autobiographical issue, and you have both been described as writers of place. Certainly places have animated your imaginations, yet each of you seem to have dealt quite differently with the matter. Wendell, you first. You went away from home in Kentucky, off to college, then to graduate school at Stanford as a writing fellow and landed in New York City. Perhaps like many of your generation in the South, you seemed launched away from your home. 
You've written about the drain of people from rural communities that began after the Second World War, and perhaps you were simply part of that drain, a drain that might have seemed required to have a life of the imagination. But in fairly short order, you returned to a farm not far from your parents' home place in Henry County, Kentucky. What was first involved in that adventure of leaving, and what turned you around and sent you home? Well, at this uh, distance, I can't really take credit for much of anything except instinct. I, um, I think um, that the return happened because Tanya and I both wanted to, to return, and um, I did very much. And I think the, uh, that it was a justifiable thing to do as I can see now in, in uh, retrospect, because I had belonged to this place uh, all my life, or most of it, uh, well, really all of it. I'd belonged to it even when I was somewhere else. And this was going, obviously, to, be, to have to be my subject. And uh, as a writer, but I can see now that there's a problem about turning your subject into subject matter uh, as if it were some kind of raw material that didn't have any dignified existence until you uh, took it over and made something of it. <laughs> and it seems to me that uh, living in your subject keeps you well advised. Gary, uh, from a rural home in Washington, in a depression left-wing household. You traveled as a young man and went to Reed College and then to the San Francisco Bay Area, apparently all along on your way to Japan. Kyoto must have seemed as far from home as you could imagine. But then after 15 or more years on the road, you returned to Homestead in the Sierra foothills where you've remained for 30 years. What was happening, happening in your life with all that travel? And then what changed when you broke ground at Kit Kit Dizzy? In my first uh, 11 years or so, uh, I was on a farm uh, up north of Seattle, uh, a little orchard, some milk cows, quite a flock of chickens. Uh, and I, uh, I very much liked that life, uh, although people tell me that it was a hard life and that it was the Depression then, um, which I never noticed. Uh, but World War II came along and unsettled our family as it unsettled so many others. Uh, I don't know quite exactly what went down, but the farm got sold, uh, 